Welcome to the Mark Steiner Show here on The Real News. I'm Mark Steiner, and it's good to have you all with us. Today, we bring you a conversation that I had with Ken Roth, who retired as the head of Human Rights Watch, which he ran from 1993 to 2022. He was dubbed the godfather of human rights by The New York Times. And under his watch, the organization took on human rights abuses across the planet, here in the United States, Saudi Arabia, China, Rwanda, and the Palestinian Authority, and Israel. That's when the proverbial dung hit the fan. When Ken Roth retired from Human Rights Watch, he was offered a fellowship at Harvard's prestigious Kennedy School. Then something happened. Several weeks into his expected appointment, the Harvard Kennedy School dean, Douglas Elmendorf, rescinded, squashed, stopped his appointment. Why? Ken Roth is one of the most recognized defenders of human rights in the world. Could it have been because avid Zionist supporters like Leslie Wexner, the owner of Victoria's Secret, gave $40 million so that Israeli intelligence could participate at the Kennedy School? Or that Robert Belfer, who runs Enron, whose family escaped the Nazis, gave $20 million to fund a center in his name? That, by the way, cooperates with U.S. intelligence services. Could there be a connection? Well, before we get too far into this, let me add that Ken Ross family also barely escaped the Nazis on the eve of World War II. So when I learned about all of this, I invited Ken Roth to join me for a conversation to explore all of this, the state of human rights in the world, and the power of neoliberal and conservative Zionism that have muddied the waters of anti-Semitism that already runs deep and plagues human society. When his appointment was rescinded, a firestorm erupted across the globe. Harvard backed down. They rescinded their denial of his appointment. So we asked Ken Roth to rejoin us to assess what all that means and what it might mean for the future. Now, as we bring you this conversation, keep in mind what Ken Roth said during our conversation about all the other people who are censored and punished in their careers for criticizing Israel who don't have a name as lauded and known as Ken Roth. So this conversation will also relaunch our series, Not In Our Name, the voices of Jews and others from across the globe saying, the oppression against Palestinians cannot be done in our name, especially now with a neo-fascist government in control of Israel. So here's my conversation with Ken Roth, right here on The Mark Steiner Show on The Real News. Hello and welcome to The Mark Steiner Show here on The Real News. I'm Mark Steiner and it's great to have you all with us. Earlier in January, I taped an interview with Ken Roth, who was retiring as the head of Human Rights Watch. He joined us because he was offered a position at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government's Carr Center for Human Rights Policy. Then his appointment was rescinded by the Harvard Kennedy School Dean, Douglas Elmendorf, allegedly because of Human Rights Watch critique of Israel, at least that's the popular wisdom, and a firestorm erupted. And lo and behold, they then rescinded their denial of his appointment. So we asked Ken Roth to rejoin us to assess what all that means, what it might mean for the future, and welcome back, Ken Roth, and congratulations on the appointment. Well, thank you, Mark, and thanks for having me back. Let me just clarify one thing. Please. It's not just surmise that Dean Elmendorf initially um, vetoed my fellowship because of my and Human Rights Watch's criticism of Israel. That's what he said to Catherine Sicking, a very respected professor at the Kennedy School. So, you know, there was really never any doubt about that reason. The question is, is that a good reason? And for two weeks, once this became public, the Kennedy School Dean was lambasted in the media. There were protests at Harvard. There was a Kennedy School faculty meeting where I understand nobody spoke out in defense of the Dean's decision. Wow. Everybody opposed it. And so, you know, yes, he changed his mind. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I was quoted in the New York, he was quoted in the New York Times saying that donors do not affect our consideration of academic matters. My decision was also not made to limit debate at the Kennedy School about human rights in any country and would not specify why he rejected your fellowship, except to say, quote, based on my evaluation of, of his potential contributions to the school, which means you have nothing to offer, but we're going to let you in anyway. <laughs> well, I mean, to, to say that he's not going to limit debate at Harvard, I mean, that's kind of a red herring because right, right. You know, nobody, nobody accused him of running around and, you know, putting um, two, you know, putting, putting, you know, silencers on students' mouths or whatever, you know, it's not how it worked. But the question was, do they appoint somebody like me who fairly, but outspokenly criticizes Israel? And the initial answer was no. Um, and now that they've changed their mind. Now, you know, Elmendorf, the dean, says that donors were not behind this decision. 
Um, but what he had told people, um, one of the professors there, was that people who mattered to him had urged him not to appoint me. We don't know who those people who mattered to him are. And indeed, he's citing the confidentiality of the appointment process to not say who those people who matter to him are. He, he's willing to breach the confidentiality enough to say they weren't donors, but okay, so who were they? <laughs> we don't know, okay? But, but the bigger question here, Mark, is actually um, what this means for academic freedom yeah. at Harvard generally. Because, you know, I have a certain visibility having led Human Rights Watch for three decades. And I was able to mobilize massive media outrage. You know, students and faculty came to my defense. And so in my case, he did the right thing and reversed himself. But we don't have much assurance that this same kind of censorship wouldn't go on for people with less visibility. You know, a younger faculty member, ordinary students, you know, people who don't have the capacity to, to make as much of a ruckus as I was able to, will they face penalization for having criticized Israel. And while Harvard is, you know, affirming academic freedom in the abstract, which is the least they can do, they're not coming out and saying, we are going to take steps to ensure that people are not penalized because they criticize Israel. And so many people, myself included, are worried that, okay, my case, which was in the public's eye, it was spotlighted, they did the right thing. But what about lesser cases, you know, where, where it just happens under the radar screen? And it's not just at Harvard, but in many, many other schools where, you know, you hear accounts of people who are penalized because they've criticized Israel. So this is a, you know, far broader problem than my own case. And, you know, I'm happy my case was resolved positively, but there's a bigger problem out there that needs to be addressed. So <clears throat> given that, um, there's, there's, it raises a number of issues. You've raised, just raised a number of issues, at least for me, which is that you've given this, you've been given this appointment. You'll be there. You'll be, um, I assume, lecturing and doing research. So I actually start the fellowship February sixth, um, and I will. Um, I, I, the whole purpose of the fellowship initially was so that I could work on the book that I'm right. writing, and I will do that. But I will also give lectures, I'll see students, I'll see faculty, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll make the most of the time that I'm there. So the question is, I'm, I'm very curious how you think what might unfold given what you've just described. Um, oh, I, I have no doubt that, you know, I can say whatever I want. I mean, no, nobody's going to try to silence me. Um, you know, I think a lot of people will want to see me at this stage. Um, but what I, I'm going to make a point of discussing is the broader issue of academic freedom. I don't want people thinking that just because I'm finally allowed into the Harvard Kennedy School that the problem has disappeared. And exactly. indeed, there's, there's, you know, there's a very good article in The Nation which broke the story of the censorship in my case, you know, the fact that it was my criticism of Israel behind Elmendor's veto of my fellowship. There now is a, a follow-up article written by students at Harvard who say that this problem of penalization, of really trying to restrict criticism of Israel, is a problem far beyond my case. And I think we have to listen to that. This is certainly the, what people are perceiving. And I think it is incumbent upon the Harvard leadership, Larry Bacow, the president, um, or Dean Elmendorf at the Kennedy School, to go out of their way to reaffirm their commitment to academic freedom even when less visible people are criticizing Israel. So, what I, I, this raises a number of issues. I mean, I'm just curious how you think we should all proceed in many ways. I mean, Israel itself is a really complex situation. Um, and in your life, you, you're Jewish. You um, were raised in a family who fled the Holocaust from Germany, um, as many of us are in this generation. My family went through the pogroms. They went through the Holocaust. I grew up with people in my living room with numbers on their arms. I knew what that meant. It made me join the civil rights movement as a young kid early because of that. So, and but then there's Israel. And Israel, you know, like many of us were probably, I don't know about you, Ken, but many of us were like Zionists when we were really young because we believed in what we saw there. Um, and then that began to change, especially after 67, 68. Um, 
And so, and it said, it, and it, it is tied in a, in a real weird dialectical dance around anti-Semitism. You can't, and, and it's difficult to separate the two, even though critique of Israel doesn't make you an anti-Semite, there is this kind of weird dance about all that that makes it complex. So I'm just curious, given everything you've been through, given what you did in Human Rights Watch when you critiqued Israel, and I've read all the reports, and you also critiqued Palestine and the Palestinian Authority, for their lack yeah, of democracy. The whole, the whole crap. Right, all of that. So to talk a bit about that complexity and how you think we unravel that, especially in positions like yours. Well, I mean, let me make a few points. I mean, one is that, Mark, you're absolutely right that the Israel-Palestine issue is complex, which is precisely why you want academic freedom in a place like the Harvard Kennedy School, so that students can hear all sides. You know, you don't want to cherry pick. And, you know, the Kennedy School invites literally 10 Israeli officials as fellows every single year. You know, every once in a while, they'll invite a Palestinian. At one stage, they had the, the PLO chief negotiator. But, you know, I think that the problem with me was that, um, you know, all of those people are, are clearly partial. They're clearly biased. They represent one side or the other. Right. I'm impartial. You know, Human Rights Watch calls it as we see it, as objectively as we can. That gives our criticism extra sting as far as the Israeli government is concerned. And I think that's why I wasn't wanted to begin with. Now, you know, Mark, you talk about, you know, your experience joining the civil rights movement. Um, you know, I had the same experience. I, I joined the human rights movement because of my father's experience fleeing the Nazis as a young boy. And so, you know, I think, um, you know, many Jews did draw the lesson from the Holocaust that, you know, you need to strengthen human rights norms. You need to strengthen the sense that nobody should be subjected to these kinds of abuses. And, and I do think that that's the dominant view among American Jews. But there are some people who took from the Holocaust the need to just be tougher than the next guy. You know, don't pick on me. You know, we're, the, the, the Jews during the Holocaust didn't have a state. Now they have a state, you know, and that state's going to be more powerful than anybody who, who might want to attack it. And so there are these two traditions that come out of it. Um, I'm not advocating for a weak state, but I am advocating that, you know, even a strong state has to respect rights because ultimately, you know, people's sense of right and wrong, the sense that, you know, everybody has rights that need to be respected is key to, I think, the long-term survival of, of Israel and the Jews, you know, particularly when Israel lives in such a hostile neighbor where, neighborhood where, you know, who knows what the crazies in Iran might do if they get a nuclear bomb. So, you know, you want these norms against abusing people to be as strong as possible. That's a critical part of the defense, I think, not only of Israel, but of Jewish people around the world. Now, you know, you also, you make this point about anti-Semitism and, and this, you know, I mean, I get accused of being an anti-Semite, which yes, is crazy. I'm sure. You know, I'm 100% Jewish. I, I'm, you know, I, I totally identify. But this is one way that some people feel is appropriate to try to silence critics of Israel. And, you know, I get the short-term advantage, you know, for the, for the state of Israel. If you get rid of a critic here or a critic there because they're worried about being accused of anti-Semitism, you know, it makes Israel's reputation a little bit better. But my fear is that this cheapens the very important concept of anti-Semitism. Because if people begin to view anti-Semitism as just a ploy to silence criticism of Israel, that's going to weaken the defense of something that remains a very important threat to Jews around the world. So you actually, you know, maybe strengthening the Israeli state at the expense of Jews wherever they live. And that is not a smart move. Um, so, I mean, I, I wonder, Ken, how much of this particular issue will encompass the work that you have to do now at Harvard and other places and other work you're doing? I mean, is, is it central to it? Is it just part of it? I mean, what, how, how, does this, how does this affect what you do from here on in? Yeah. Well, Mark, I mean, you know, although some of the critics of Human Rights Watch pretend that, you know, all we do is criticize Israel. Right, right. Israel is one out of a hundred countries that we work on. You know, it is a tiny percentage of our work. And that's not going to change. And so, you know, these days I'm being asked a lot to speak about what just happened at Harvard. That's understandable. But I have a much broader set of concerns. And, and while, you know, at Harvard, I undoubtedly will, will be addressing this issue, 
I'm also going to be talking about, you know, the big problems that are affecting the world, the enormous threat that the Chinese government poses to the world, you know, the horrible war crimes that Russia is committing in Ukraine, you know, the, the you know, other abuses from, from Saudi Arabia to, you know, the Sudanese military to the Myanmar junta, you know, I can go on. But there are big problems in the world. You know, the Israeli-Palestinian issue is one of them, but I'm going to continue to speak more broadly. And I, and I just, as you were going through that list, you know, and I've seen the work of Human Rights Watch over the years and the, the I mean, the, and I also would worry, I'm curious at your, your thought on this, about the role our own country plays in all of this, in the countries that we support, um, and that, that, have, that, are, that are littered with human rights abuses, uh, and how that plays into it all. I mean, that's also a difficult thing to do because you're also walking into Harvard, which is a place that clearly the U.S. intelligence service has a huge influence and presence in terms of scholars and more, and who they bring in. So, I mean, that... that there could be a rub there as well, but an important one to maybe rub, for want of a better term. I mean, the, the U.S. government, you know, has a very mixed record on human rights. Now, obviously, under Trump, it was a disaster. I mean, Trump, you know, couldn't find a friendly autocrat he didn't want to embrace. You know, there was... <laughs> right, right. There, you, know. Um, you know, Biden is doing somewhat better, but he's still been disappointing. So, you know, on, on two big threats, the Chinese government the Russian government, Biden has been quite strong. But he has treated most of the rest of the world as just potential allies against China and Russia, regardless of what their human rights record. And so again, the most visible case of that is when he flew off to Saudi Arabia, did his famous fist bump with the Saudi crown prince, begging for him to pump just a smidgen more oil, which he didn't even do, and just forgetting about you know, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, forgetting about the imprisonment of Saudi dissidents, forgetting about you know, the Saudi-led coalition's repeated bombardment of Yemeni civilians. All that just went out the window to try to get Saudi Arabia on board in pumping a little bit more oil so there'd be less inflation and the coalition against Russia could stand together. You know, and that has been his approach to kind of you know, a range of quite abusive countries around the world which he just views as, you know, part of a geopolitical alliance against China and Russia. And, you know, that's obviously a disaster for the people of these countries who suddenly, you know, don't have the U.S. pushing for their rights. But it also, you know, ironically undermines the fight for human rights in Russia and China. Because, you know, if, if U.S. pronouncements about human rights say, you know, Xi Jinping's mass detention of Uyghurs in Xinjiang, or Putin's war crimes in, in Ukraine, if those are seen as just, you know, statements of convenience rather than statements of principle, they are much less effective in, in even getting human rights done in the countries that Biden cares about. I, you know, I was thinking about the work you've done and what is what comes next and your work at Harvard and more, um, because we, I think we're witnessing on the planet today a real move towards right-wing authoritarianism across the globe um, and in our own country that we that that you can you can see it you can see it in the governor of Florida statements and and, and, and other people in this country so I mean it, it seems to me that the work you're about to launch what's happening now at Harvard may be a lot more complex and difficult to get through um, and it, it, the critique for anybody going after that could become pretty severe I mean, Mark, you're right that there is an autocratic threat out there. But as I look at the world these days, I think it's a pretty hostile environment for autocrats. I mean, you first of all have, you know, both China and Russia presenting just, you know, obvious examples of how misguided autocrats can be because they suppress any debate about public policy. And so, you know, Xi Jinping's disastrous zero COVID policy, you know, his, his attacks on the most vibrant sectors of the Chinese economy because they were seen as political threats. I mean, these are really harming the Chinese people. Or, you know, Putin's disastrous invasion of Ukraine and the, the war crimes he's presiding over. This is what happens when you have an unaccountable dictator. And so we've seen people around the world protesting against autocratic rule. You know, that's what happened in Hong Kong. Um, you know, that's, that's, you can go with Myanmar, Russia, Belarus, you know, Sudan, Uganda, Cuba, Nicaragua. I mean, almost every continent, there are these big public protests for democracy against autocratic rule. And, you know, this is not an environment where people are begging to be led by a dictator. Now, you know, there still are, you know, some people like, say, Hungarian Prime Minister Orban, who has managed to stay in power. Um, 
President Sisi in Egypt is, is clinging to power. Erdogan in Turkey is in trouble right now. Um, a lot does depend on how principled the Western governments are. You know, those who say that they're the best promoters of human rights, but if they are very opportunistic, you know, and, and just, you know, treat human rights as an instrument of broader geopolitical challenges rather than a principal commitment, it's going to weaken this global effort to combat them. So that's what I worry about. And so just, I, we can conclude here in a couple of minutes because I, 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 but I'm, I'm interested in what you think happens at the institution you're in and other institutions as we d debate and look at this, this really critical issue for the future. I mean, before this all happened to you, Chelsea Manning was denied um, a, a place. Um, then Governor Rick Snyder of Michigan because of Flint. And whether it's coming from the right, it comes from many different directions. But this kind of um, kind of narrowing the discussion, especially in places like uh, 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 academic institutions that are wrestling with these issues for the future of mankind, that's a, to me, that's a dangerous signal. Mark, I completely agree with you. And, and I want to stress that this can be a problem on the left as well as the right. You know, you, you get people on the left who are shouting down, you know, various people who they, you know, feel are, are wrong for some reason, you know, rather than allowing them to say their two cents. And you can then debate what they have to say. And particularly in a university, particularly in the academy where, you know, free speech should prevail. I think we have to be more attentive to these censorship efforts from all parts of the political spectrum. You know, we should be able to hear what the other side has to say. We may not agree with them, but we're better off for hearing it. And then we can debate it and we can arrive at our own conclusions. The answer is not to just, you know, censor and try to prevent them from speaking altogether. And I think that, you know, this is a tendency that the academy is succumbing to, and it's a tendency that we need to resist. So finally, I mean, what you just said, I have to, that makes me think of the the, the, the early beginnings of the anti-war movements in this country. In some ways, after in, because of the civil rights movement, coalesced around Mario Salvo, Silvio, and and the free speech movement at Berkeley, and that, you know, and the, and and how it kind of exploded from that. So I and I'm just curious how you how you think you're going to approach your tenure, your work now, in light of everything that's just happened to you and all the things you've just described. Well, I'm going to continue talking about the threats to rights wherever they come from. You know, I've always been an equal opportunity critic. Um, human <laughs> rights have. work on, you know, on 100 <laughs> countries. You know, I don't talk about 100 countries, but I, I talk about probably 30 or 40 on a pretty regular basis. I'm going to continue to do that. It's going to be, you know, a changing cast of characters as, as the issues come and go. But, um, you know, I do feel that, you know, one privilege I had of heading Human Rights Watch for three decades is that I did develop a global perspective. And, and I think that that enables me to make a contribution in describing these trends and the threats to rights wherever they come from. I'm going to keep that up. Well, Ken Roth, I appreciate you taking the time again. I look forward to seeing you back in the States, continuing our conversations and seeing where all this takes us. So thank you so well, much for joining for us and, and congratulations for getting the appointment. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed our conversation today with Ken Roth. I want to thank you all for joining us today. And please let me know what you thought about what you heard today, what you'd like us to cover. Just write to me at mss at therealnews.com and I'll write you right back. And while you're here, please go to w www.therealnews.com forward slash support. Become a monthly donor and become part of the future with us. So for Cameron Grandino and Kelly Rivara and the crew here at The Real News, I'm Mark Steiner. Stay involved, stay in touch, and keep listening. Take care. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.